Hi guys, welcome to this week's episode of Between Us Girls. That's between myself, Tendai, and the lovely Dr. Stee, our resident media medic. Are you ready for today's episode? Oh yes, I am. Oh yes, say hi to the people. Hi everyone, <laughs> it's so good to be back. Honestly, mm. good to have you. Mm. Okay, so today we're talking about sexual health, misconceptions and myths around contraceptives. Okay, so there are lots of ideas floating around and people in different age groups probably have different ideas. Mm. So hopefully today we can just sort of hmm, demythologize, I made up that word, mm. <laughs> certain ideas um, around contraceptives. Yeah. So I get, the, I get asked the question a lot, mm -hmm. which contraception should I use? Which is the best? And there's no one answer. Mm. There are so many different types, almost 20 different types that you can choose from. Mm -hmm. And it's case by case basis, different types for different women. Okay. Yeah. So in order to understand what works best for your body, mm. what do you need to do? What do you need to know? Okay. So basically just, you need to make certain decisions. There's hormonal methods and there's barrier methods. Okay. Hormonal methods are the ones people are always a bit like, not sure about. That's where some of these myths come in. Okay, so, for example. Will I gain weight if I use the pill? That's the number one question I get asked. Yeah. And the truth is, back in the day, yes, because our, hormone, our hormonal pills had a lot of estrogen and progesterone, mm -hmm. and yes, they really made people gain weight. But now, the combination pills especially actually don't do that. What they do, though, is they can increase your appetite. Okay. That's one of the side effects. So then you might eat more and then you gain the weight. But them on themselves, they won't. So under, under word, underline the word might. Yes. And actually that myth is actually founded on people's real experiences. Exactly. So it's, it's a might because of the... the, the the appetite mm -hmm. but then also there's something which happens with the distribution of the fat around the body okay. so you might perceive to have gained weight because now you look different mm -hmm. maybe you're fuller breasts or bigger hips now but you're actually the same weight it's just a redistribution of the fat deposit okay. All yeah. right. so looking at this from i guess in terms of some sort of empowerment you know for a woman to have agency over the decisions over her own body mm. now let's say you're a young you're a young woman. Mm -hmm. In a society, it's not like it's very easy to sort of make appointments or go to, you know, professionals mm. to, to sort of ask mm. um, which type of contraceptive can I be on? Because, you know, the exactly. idea is you should still be at school, just focusing on your books. Mm. What is a boyfriend? Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've seen that a lot, especially with some of these elderly nurses or mm. the older doctors. And there's a girl who's sexually active, genuinely coming to look for advice of what she should use mm. but she's chased away we're putting those girls at risk because she's going to do it anyway mm -hmm. but now without the being equipped to protect herself from pregnancy or stis and hiv absolutely so i think it's absolutely important to give them that information because they're going to do it anyway okay and i yeah. think this sort of speaks back to that cultural influence and sort of making sure people are educated that when they're mm. in their profession they should sort of put a pause on what they assume they know. In culture and, yeah, because for them, they'll be seeing their own child. Mm. You, you're imagining your daughter, you're like, no, you're too young. But sexual health is as from the time the girl decides she's going to have sex, mm. she needs to be equipped to make the right choices. And this is where the sexual health empowerment comes in. Ah, well, it's, it's a controversial topic around young people and mm. young bodies maybe, yes. because it's a reflection about our expectations and what we think society should be mm. but just moving away from that a little bit um looking at i guess different women from different homes sometimes the idea of contraceptives itself even as an adult woman is not something that's particularly um endorsed in the home right mm. maybe for the man it's like no I want us to have more kids. Maybe you're a child number seven. <laughs> well, I'm exaggerating, but it's, it's kind of like one person wants something different. So the mm. woman wants something different and the man wants something different. Mm. So what can they do in those situations to be empowered? Or what have you come across in mm. the public health spaces that could yeah. help inform um, that? So, yeah. So it's funny you ask that because 
they always say the man always says that I, whatever number I want, mm. it's the woman who decides how many children we're going to have. Okay. <laughs> and usually, after with like our family planning talks, it's always just the woman who's there. Mm. She's she's making the decision for the whole family. Yet it's supposed to be family planning. So it's supposed to be a decision made by the man and the woman. Mm -hmm. But in our setting, what I've seen is that the woman is the one who decides. So as long as we give her the right information, she's aware and she's educated of what's out there, what's available for her to use, then you can have a stable family unit and have the number of children that you have planned to have. Right, because that really speaks to the heart of a couple's family structure and plan, right? Mm. So, I mean, I think I've heard of situations where, you know, the woman is like, I'm not going to tell my husband. I'm just getting on mm. <laughs> whatever contraceptive I can to manage mm. the situation and not tell him. Yeah, we do have a few, I mean, cultural and some religious um, mm. sects that don't believe in contraception. Right. But having many children, I mean, 10, 12 children, you see women coming in mm. um, who are powerless to stop this, end up going on to contraception just so that they can control the numbers. Um, higher numbers of children puts a family at a disadvantage, especially when you're not empowered um, financially to look after them. So it is important mm. to give that woman the option that she that okay the husband might not know about this but i'm going to do it to protect the family which we don't endorse but i've seen it happening quite a lot and there are types of contraceptions such as the implants or even the pill that a woman can take and the husband may not know about it all right mm. okay so on that note we're going to come back after the break and talk more about sexual health and a few other myths that we're hoping that Dr. Steve can help us bust. Stay tuned, Between Us Girls. Hi guys, welcome back to the second part of our discussion on sexual health misconceptions and myths around contraceptives between us girls, between myself, Tendai, and Dr. Sti, our resident media medic. Mm. Okay, so taking us back to what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. We were talking about some of the myths surrounding contraceptives. Mm -hmm. And another one that's been floating around is this idea that if you haven't had kids before, you can't go on the loop. Mm. What's, is that true, is it not? So um, the loop or IUD, mm -hmm. intrauterine device, sits in the uterus. It's like a T-shape, usually made of copper, mm -hmm. can release hormones or not. Mm -hmm. And it prevents pregnancy because it's in the uterus and nothing can occupy the uterus. Mm. So if you've never had a baby, the uterus is still very small. Okay. And it might be uncomfortable to insert it. Oh. That's the issue. Okay. Not that you can't have it but it's usually not used for pre-women who've not had babies before. Just because it would be uncomfortable? A little bit uncomfortable at inception, but after that, it's fine. Okay, you can just get on with the business of life. <laughs> the nice thing about the IUD is you can keep it for up to five years mm -hmm. and nothing, do nothing about it, and you're protected all that time. Okay. The, the cons, though, is that when you've just put it on, a bit of heavy bleeding and cramping, for up to six months. Oh, okay. But after that, you're home and dry. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, Literally dry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the clarification. <laughs> um, looking at the context that we're in, and we're talking about um, sexual health and contraceptives, yeah. I think a big uh, spotlight has been shone on the use of condoms, right, mm. in, in our country, and how usually that's the one area where in terms of contraceptives women might find themselves at a disadvantage in terms of demanding okay can you use a condom right mm. um simply because i guess it's so obvious and visible and also maybe shares the burden of um, protection with mm. the man mm. or makes him you know i wouldn't say in charge but he yes. has to play his part in it yes. right and yeah. so that's the area that's kind of a bit gray because at least with um, the loop and taking the pill and stuff, mm. it's 
no one can see it, right? Mm. Right. So yeah. Yeah. what's sort of the situation around that? Because before you were talking about women are more empowered when, you know, they can take the pill and things like yes. that in terms of family planning. Yes. But then when it comes to the condom, it's yes. not so much an area of empowerment. No, it's not. So like we were saying, um, most of these contraceptives, the woman is in charge, is empowered, except for the condom. Mm. But the problem with the condom as well, it's the only contraceptive that also protects against STIs and HIV mm -hmm. specifically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in our context, where 15% of people are HIV positive, this is a real epidemic where people need to be protected. So the condom then becomes the most important contraception okay. in our country. But then women are not empowered to use it because it's the one that's controlled usually by, by the, the man. man. Okay. You can carry it as a woman, but when it comes to the act, you need to be both on board to make that decision to use it. And so what about the female? The female I mean, condom? Yes. Not used much. It's available in Zimbabwe, in, in Africa, but not much has been collected in terms of data mm. and research about its use. It's, it's a very good way of using it, but ha people have complained that it's noisy and uncomfortable and looks awkward. Mm. But it is, it's nice because the female is also the one who makes the decision to use it or not. Uh, but then again, it can be refused by the man, yeah. unlike the other contraceptives. Okay. Mm. And it's also, I guess, one of those areas where people talk about like ease of use or comfort, right? Mm. And so that also plays a part in people finally making the decision to, okay, should I actually use a condom or not? Yeah. Okay. I think the one thing the female condom has over the male condom is with the male condom, after the sexual act, you have to pull out mm. after the man ejaculates. Okay. With the female condom, you don't need to do that. Mm -hmm. So that's a plus. And I think the people who created it wanted to give a bit more leverage during the sexual act to say, let's just continue or not or whatever. But yeah, so it has its disadvantages in that sense. Mm -hmm. But it must be, we must um, really try and empower the woman mm -hmm. so that she can convince the man to use the condom to have that um, confidence and self-esteem to mm -hmm. be able to say, this is what I want. Okay. Yeah. Um, so just going back a bit, because um, you talked about the 15% um, rate of um, HIV infections in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. um, it's gone down. It's gone down over the years, but it's still too high. Mm -hmm. Our incidence is still at a rate which is not acceptable. Absolutely. And the age groups that we are seeing now is the 15 to 45 um, year olds that mm. are getting HIV. But the interesting thing is now it's mainly the married couples that mm. are more at risk because they're the ones who don't use condoms. There's no condom use. As opposed to before when the risk groups were commercial sex workers. Yeah. Um, but they are now more aware and they are more likely to protect themselves. Because it's their line of work. Yes. So they need to make sure they can perform and function. Yes. But now you can imagine in a married couple, mm. if one of the partners has HIV and brings it home, it's difficult now to navigate to say, how are we going to protect? How am I going to protect myself from my spouse mm. or my partner against the HIV when you suddenly want to start using condoms? Yeah, I, I would imagine that's tricky because there should be trust, obviously, in the married home, mm. right? So you, mm. you wouldn't necessarily imagine every day that <laughs> your partner is going out Suddenly. And, yeah, and gallivanting yes. the streets or whatever yes. people are doing. Mm. But the impact is quite devastating because I don't imagine you could then sit down with your partner and say, listen, I've been cheating and now you need to use a condom because I've got this STI. Yeah. That's a very difficult conversation. But we need to normalize condom use in marriage. It shouldn't be something that is so wild that I can't do that. It's a very um, useful contraception. Many people use it. And also to protect yourself from STIs if one of the couples is a discordant with HIV, mm. trying to protect the other couple. Is that, a realistic, is that a realistic thing we can do in our society? Yes. Would you sort of challenge this idea of trust in marriages? 
Well, and I'm not saying that to the exclusion of someone's health. I'm just saying the mental kind of space around it. Mm. Well, it, it does, but I've got good news as well. Mm. There's risk groups have now also been given what is called PrEP, which is pre-exposure prophylaxis to mm -hmm. HIV. So they're given a pill that they'll take every day just to protect themselves from uh, like in, in a discordant marriage where one partner is HIV positive and the other isn't. So the one who's negative takes this PrEP every day and it gives them a level of protection from the partner who's positive. Do you need the other partner to be present? What if you just suspect? Well, we always advocate for this to be a group decision, that Same. they come together and they make the decision. But in a case where a woman is afraid or a man is afraid of the, 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 the wife or whatever, the partner, we, we can say, you take this and you'll be protected against. All the other risk groups are also on this prep, um, sex, sex workers, mm -hmm. um, MSMs, and all the other key populations. Okay, mm. all right. Mm. Um, and what about this conversation around sort of bringing a balance more to, um, it shouldn't just be the woman's responsibility, right, mm. in terms of contraceptives and stuff like that, because mm. everything, we've got the pill, and I know we've got the condom. Mm. Are there any other ways that the men can also partake in this because you know as we've pointed out in other conversations it takes mm. two to tango oh, and does. this sort of thing mm. so are there any other methods that you know men can use as well and help to take responsibility in an issue like this well to do with um contraceptives specifically um men can have a vasectomy um, where they cut their tubes. Mm -hmm. Women can also do that, mm -hmm. but that's a little bit more permanent and yeah. it's a bit difficult to do that if you, and if you're not sure if that's the end of your line of kids or whatever. Um, how, how affordable is that? It's a surgical, minor surgical procedure mm -hmm. that can be done if you organize with the surgeon. So it's, it's not something you just do overnight. It can be planned with a good medical aid cover. Mm -hmm. um, and there are new innovations now. There's a pill for men, the mm -hmm. injections for men. Mm -hmm. um, not being taken up very well, but I mean, <laughs> as we go, things are becoming more and more normal. Any of those available in Zimbabwe? Uh, not yet, <laughs> but we hope that soon things will come and okay. be available. And right, and like you always say, which I've taken from you, a happy body is a happy mind. Yes, so. yes. When you're empowered to make the right choices, when you're not afraid of tomorrow because you've had an unplanned pregnancy or a woman is empowered, she is happy. And when she's happy, she's able to then make decisions for her entire life. Mm. And that affects everyone else around her as well. Absolutely. Mm. All right, guys, thanks for tuning in to this week's episode. If you want to talk more about issues surrounding sexual health, please feel free to get in touch with us on our social media handles. That's at Tando Channel, capital T, capital C, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks, Dr. Steve. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much.